Hello friends, welcome to the second installment in our Creepiest Disappearances series. Tonight we bring you five more of the most bizarre and strange disappearances we've come across. Sit back, relax, buckle up your seatbelts, it's going to be a wild ride. Number five, Lynn Palmer. 71-year-old retired nurse, Mara Lynn, Lynn Palmer, was an active member in her community in Fall River Mills, California. Lynn had previously worked at the local hospice and was known to many around town for her incredible work. Just because Lynn had retired, it didn't mean that she planned on slowing down. She volunteered at a thrift store to help keep her occupied and maintained a busy social life. In an interview for NBC, Lynn's son, Dave, said, she went bowling with friends every Tuesday night, and she was proud that she could go on a four-mile walk and be fine, as well as a volunteer four to five times per week. On April 20th, 2018, Lynn spent the day volunteering at the thrift store before returning to her home in the 23,000 block of Castle Fall River Road, an unpopulated but beautiful area, according to her son. Lynn walked through the door at around 4.30 p.m., said hello to her husband Bob, and grabbed a light beer out of the fridge. Lynn left the house once again, but this time to walk the dog, Lucy, that they had been taking care of for a few days. Lucy the dog belonged to Lynn's stepdaughter and Bob's biological daughter, and according to articles, they had been looking after her for a few days while the owner was unavailable. Lynn and Lucy headed southeast from the home and into the woods and it would be four agonizing days until there was any sign of either of them. After 15 minutes had passed and Lynn still hadn't returned home, Bob began to worry. He knew that Lynn's route should have only taken her 15 minutes. Then another 10 minutes passed and there was still no sign of Lynn or Lucy. Concerned, Bob left the house and began looking for them but found no sign of them. When 45 minutes had passed, Bob began going door to door and asking neighbors if they had seen the duo. To his horror, no one had. Now in a state of panic, Bob called Lynn's brother-in-law, who's a volunteer firefighter for the Fall River Mills Fire Department, and asked for their assistance in finding Lynn. Her brother-in-law sprang into action and along with Bob, combed the area for an hour, but to no avail. Realizing that something was very wrong at this point, Bob picked up the phone, dialed 911, and called the Shasta County Sheriff's Department to officially report his wife missing. By this point, Lynn's family had been made aware of her sudden and mysterious disappearance and came from all over the U.S. to help with the search. The local community soon caught wind of Lynn's disappearance. And in a Facebook post, the Sheriff's Department said, the Shasta County Search and Rescue was activated and numerous resources were deployed to the area to aid in the search for Ms. Palmer. These resources included dirt riders, mounted posse, ground team, jeepers, and mountain rescue. The Shasta County Sheriff's Office will continue to search for Ms. Palmer throughout the night. For four days, the Shasta County and the teams mentioned above searched for Lynn, but there was just no sign of her. Then on the fourth day, April 24th, something miraculous happened. Dave recalled the event in an NBC interview saying, suddenly the missing dog came back on day four. They immediately brought her into the house. There was food and water for her and she went and drank some water, but it was weird because she didn't eat any of the food. Another day passed and sadly the search was officially called off after there was no evidence found. Lynn's family weren't giving up that easily and brought in the Mendocino County Sniffer Dog Unit to see if their dogs would be able to shed some light on her mysterious disappearance. According to Dave, Lynn's son, a dog tractor sent along her main walking route out to an abandoned trailer, then to a dirt road, and then out to the main road. The scent disappeared at the main road. Since Lynn's mysterious disappearance in April 2018, her family have continued their search for her. A month after she went missing, the Shasta County Sheriff's Office said that she was considered missing under suspicious circumstances, and her case has remained open ever since. Now, in the months before her disappearance, 
Lynn had begun showing signs of dementia, and her son Dave said there were just some things she would have to repeat or things she would not remember. Her family maintains that she couldn't have gotten lost on her walk due to the confusion as it was a route she walked often and only started to forget the little things. Plus, the dog knew the route as well. Lynn's family are desperate for answers and are offering a $5,000 reward for any information that leads to her whereabouts. Dave is adamant that his mother did not leave of her own accord, telling NBC, there's one thing I do know. She didn't take off on her own will. So her body is still out there and the dog stayed until she passed away and we just haven't found her body yet. Or someone took her and either they took the dog with her or the dog followed them and then came back. They could have disposed of her or the rare case is that they still have her. Laura Lynn Lynn Palmer was last seen on April 20th, 2018. She is described as a white female with brown hair and brown eyes. Both of her ears are pierced and she has an appendectomy scar on her abdomen. Lynn was last seen wearing a t-shirt, blue jeans, tennis shoes and earrings and was possibly carrying a can of light beer and was wearing her glasses that have thick lenses. If you have any information, you're urged to contact the Shasta County Sheriff's Department at 530-245-6540. If you wish to remain anonymous, you can contact the Secret Witness Program at 530-243-2319 and you can submit an anonymous tip online at the NorCal Alliance for the Missing. The link for this will be provided in the description. Number four, Stacy Smart. 52 year old Stacy Smart was reported missing by her daughter, Nicole Santos Haman, on November 2nd, 2016, after nobody had heard from her for a while. On that same day, if you'll recall, Sherry Papini also mysteriously disappeared, only to be found alive weeks later. Papini's case garnered international media attention, while Stacy's case has been largely overshadowed and forgotten about. But here at Missing Persons Mysteries, we want to make sure that we give Stacy's case as much exposure as possible and extend our condolences to her family and pray that they find closure soon. The details in Stacy's case are few and far between. Nicole, Stacy's daughter, says that she last spoke to her mother on October 12, 2016, and knew that she was going to a housewarming party in Lewiston, California on October 15, 2016. By October 16th, all activity on Stacy's bank cards had stopped, and as Halloween rolled around, she failed to make contact with her family, which was extremely out of character. Her daughter also told Crime Watch Daily that Stacy's landline had been disconnected, which deeply concerned the family. At the time of her disappearance, Stacy was living with her boyfriend, Tony Brand, and Brand has never commented on why he didn't report his girlfriend missing or make contact with her family if he knew she was okay in the interim period before she was reported missing. Stacy's daughter, Nicole, told news media that a month before her mother mysteriously disappeared, she'd called her grandmother in tears, saying that Brand had been cheating on her and that the two had gotten into an argument. Stacy later followed up with her family, claiming that the two had made up. But then, a month later, she vanished. Investigators are keeping very tight-lipped about the investigation into Stacy's disappearance, and although her case was featured on an episode of Crime Watch Daily, few leads have surfaced. One interesting thing to note about this episode, which is available to watch on YouTube, is that Brand spoke with the producers of the show, but refused to be on camera, instead opting to just give a statement. Now, this is in no way saying that he's guilty, but it is an important thing to note. The statement provided by Brand, read by his lawyer, Douglas Gardner said, Tony was in a loving, intimate relationship with Stacy, which ended with as much mystery to him as anyone else. He has fully cooperated with the investigators in this case and is afraid for Stacy as any of her other loved ones. Law enforcement confirmed that Brand had been cooperative during their initial investigation, but requested that his lawyer, Douglas Gardner, be present when he took a lie detector test. The results of these tests have never been made public and we probably shouldn't put too much weight or validity into those results anyway. After all, there is a reason that lie detector tests aren't admissible in most courts across the world. 
a KRCR article written in November 2019, three years after Stacy's mysterious disappearance, mentions Angie Forsland, a search manager who was hired by Stacy's family following her disappearance. The article reads, Angie Forsland, the search manager hired by the Smart family to find Stacy, told KRCR in an interview in 2016 she believes he's a suspect in her disappearance. According to Forsland and the family, Smart's boyfriend changed the carpet in his home near Lewiston Lake after Smart was reported missing. He also told the family she had moved out. Stacy Smart last made contact with her family on October 12, 2016, and has not been seen or heard from since. Investigators have not stated where they believe she has met with foul play, and the investigation is currently ongoing. Stacy Smart is described as a white female with blonde hair and blue eyes. At the time of her disappearance, her hair was platinum blonde and in a pixie style cut. Stacy also has a tattoo of a red lotus bloom on her lower back and likes to wear hats. Stacy's family are desperate for answers and have teamed up with the Secret Witness Program to offer a $10,000 reward for any information that leads to her. Her family's also set up a GoFundMe. If you have any information, you're urged to contact either the Trinity County Sheriff's Department on 530-623-3740 or the Secret Witness Program on 530-243-2319. Number three, Erin Marie Gilbert. 24-year-old Erin Marie Gilbert had the world at her feet, and her family described her as a smart and responsible young woman who was athletic but also knew how to glam it up. Erin loved playing basketball, and being six foot tall, she was perfect for the sport. Her family commented that she was always happy, someone who was looking forward to all of her tomorrows. But sadly, Erin's seemingly endless supplies of tomorrow were cut short, and she has been officially listed as a missing person since July 1st, 1995. In 1994, Erin moved from her native San Francisco, California, and Everett, Washington, to Anchorage, Alaska. Erin had gotten herself a job as a nanny, and by 1995, she was living with her sister, Stephanie, and had enrolled herself in beauty school, which was due to start in the autumn of 1995. When asked about the drastic move from the mainland USA to Alaska, her sister Stephanie told NBC News, My husband traveled a lot for work, and I was alone so much of the time, so I told Erin she should come and stay with me in Alaska. She'd been living in San Francisco with her dad. Since the day that she arrived in Anchorage, Erin turned many heads, and her friends and family described her as a beautiful young woman. On June 30th, 1995, while out and about, Aaron met a man named David Combs at a bar called Chilkoot Charlie's, and the pair immediately hit it off. The two had so much in common and so much chemistry that they agreed to meet the next day on July 1st, 1995, for a proper date. July 1st rolled around, and David picked up Aaron and drove them out to the Girdwood Forest Fair in Girdwood, Alaska. The two walked around the fair, and witnesses recall seeing Aaron and David at a beer garden just before 6 p.m. The two left the beer garden and made their way over to David's car, but it wouldn't start. David had left the car lights on while they were at the fair, which had completely drained his battery. David turned to Aaron and told her that he would walk to his friend's house, which was nearby, and ask him to come and help him out. He then explained to the investigators that he walked around Girdwood and the surrounding area for two hours before realizing he couldn't find his friend's house. When David realized he couldn't find this house as initially planned, he made his way back to the fairground. As he walked toward his car, his heart sank. There was no sign of Aaron anywhere. In a rash decision, he tried his car one more time, and amazingly, this time the engine turned over and it started. Knowing that something still wasn't right, he traversed around the fair until 1 a.m. looking for his date before heading home. According to Aaron's family, David didn't tell them she was missing until 7 a.m. the next morning on July 2nd, 1995. Stephanie told NBC News, he didn't tell anyone she was missing until he called me around 7 a.m. the next morning. He said he called to make sure Aaron made it home okay. He was very casual about it. As Stephanie peered into Aaron's room and saw that it was empty, her heart immediately sank into her stomach. 
She too sensed that something was wrong, so she called the rest of the family and they drove to the fairground to conduct their own search. Aaron's family combed the fairground and the surrounding woods and even had Aaron's name broadcasted from the stage. The kid is something you'd see when a child wanders off from their parents. But Aaron never appeared from the woods and soon the Alaska State Troopers became involved and an official missing persons case was open. With the use of search dogs and helicopters, the troopers began covering the surrounding area looking for Aaron, but it was as if she had simply vanished into thin air. The state troopers have stressed Aaron's case is a missing person case and not a homicide investigation at this time. David Combs, the man that Aaron was last seen with on July 1st, 1995, has been cleared as a suspect, and the authorities claim that he has been cooperative throughout the entire ordeal. Aaron Marie Gilbert was last seen on July 1st, 1995, at the Girdwood Forest Fair in Girdwood, Alaska. She's described as a white female with brown hair and brown eyes. She has a tattoo of a large blue flower on her chest. And at the time of her disappearance, her hair was cut short into a bob. Erin is around six feet tall and weighs about 145 pounds. She was last seen wearing a black leather jacket, a black and white striped shirt, black jeans and brown mountain boots. May 4th of 2021 would have been Aaron's 50th birthday, and her family are desperate for answers. There's currently a $30,000 reward for information, and Stephanie, her sister, runs the Facebook page called Finding Aaron Marie Gilbert. If you have any information, you're urged to contact the Alaska State Troopers on 907-428-7200 or 907-269-5400. Nine, seven. Number 2. Stephen Kraft February 15, 2021 Residents of Benton Township, Michigan and beyond huddled together in the crisp air to hold a vigil to mark the 20th anniversary of Stephen Earl Kraft II's disappearance in 2001. Fred Krawczyk, who lives on Holly Street, the same street that 12-year-old Stephen disappeared from, told WNDU, I would hope that if someone did know something out there, that they would say something. Hopefully, somehow he returns. If not, well, and if he's not here with us anymore, then all I know is his family will see him in heaven if he's not here anymore. Nobody really knows that for sure. On February 15th, 2001, 12-year-old Stephen Kraft left his home on the dead end street named Holly Street to play with the two family dogs, and witnesses recall seeing him on the 2100 block of Holly Drive between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. that night. Stephen happily played outside and had promised his parents that he would be back home in time for supper, but Stephen never came through the door. According to Chief Smith of the Benton Township Police Department, Stephen's mother called police in the early morning hours of the 16th of February. Our protocol was typical. We went out and took the report, and since it was someone that young of an age, we gathered information. Who last saw him? Sometimes kids do run away, but he hadn't run away before. In the days leading up to his disappearance, Stephen had been suspended from Hull Elementary School for five days after he defended himself during a scuffle with another student. Both the headmaster and Stephen's parents said that this behavior was very out of character for him and that he was usually a quiet, well-behaved student who kept his head down. After Stephen had been reported missing, a wide-scale search began for him, and this search was spurred by a sense of urgency, not just because of his age, but because the temperature had dropped well below freezing, and Stephen wasn't wearing a hat or gloves. Police, Stephen's family, and the local community combed the area looking for any sign of the 12-year-old, caught a break when they discovered Stephen's icy footsteps walking over a frozen pond near his home on Holly Street. According to the Charlie Project, these footsteps led in the direction of Harbor Haven Ministries on Irving Street, which is approximately one block away from Holly Street where Stephen lived. After this, it appears that the trail goes cold and investigators commented that the weather, combined with his young age, made it difficult for them. On February 18, 2001, the familiar pitter-patter of feet was heard at the Kraft residence. Outside stood the older dog, a German Shepherd chow mix, 
but there was no sign of Stephen or the other dog. The dog hastily led Stephen's parents and investigators to a pond, but according to official reports, nothing was found. The day after that, on February 19, 2001, the family's other dog, six-month-old German Shepherd puppy, was found a mile and a half away from Holly Street. How had a six-month-old puppy managed to survive the freezing temperatures and travel over a mile and a half away? Could this possibly be an indication that someone took Stephen and the dogs only to let them loose because they were making too much noise or to throw off the investigation? Throughout the years, multiple searches have been performed for Stephen. In 2001, authorities searched Blue Creek and the pond near Harbor Haven Ministries but found nothing. In 2002, the search was conducted in a wooded area near the southwestern Michigan Regional Airport, but again, no trace of Stephen could be found. There was a reported sighting of Stephen in 2004, where a witness called the FBI believing that a young man matching Stephen's description was at the Midway Airport in Chicago. This sighting, unfortunately, turned out to be a case of mistaken identity, and since then, the case has remained cold. With such little evidence, all we are left with are theories. The Benton Township Police Department has said that they investigated the idea that Stephen ran away from home as well as the idea that he was abducted. It does seem very unlikely though that Stephen ran away, especially on a cold February evening when he promised his parents he would be home in time for supper. The FBI stated in their report that Stephen was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin and has ties there as well as Lexington, Kentucky. It's also possible that Stephen died due to exposure or an accident on that evening but without a body or evidence, all we can do is speculate. Stephen's family have never given up hope and are asking for the public's assistance in his case. Stephen Earl Craft II, also listed sometimes as Stephen Earl Craft Jr., was last seen on February 15, 2001, in the 2100 block of Holly Drive in Benton Harbor, Michigan. Stephen is described as a white male with light brown hair and green eyes. He has a small red birthmark on his left rib. At the time he went missing, he was around 5 foot 1 to 5 foot 2 inches tall and around 100 pounds. Stephen was last seen wearing a white, tan and brown striped shirt, tan parachute pants, an aqua and purple Charlotte Hornets jacket, and black lugs boots. If still alive today, Stephen would be 32 years old. Anyone with any information is urged to contact the Benton Township Police Department at 269-926-8221 and listen for the extension for Stevens tip line. Alternatively, you can contact the FBI's St. Joseph, Michigan office on 313-965-2323. Number 1. Shanna Boiteau We will always love you no matter what. We will support you and help you. Just come home and we'll face everything together. We want you back home with us and to be a mother to your beautiful daughter. At the very least, call and let us know you're okay. So it reads a message from the father of missing 22-year-old Shanna Boiteau. Her family describe her as a devoted mother and loving daughter and are desperate for answers as to what happened on that June day in 2016. On that day, Shanna left her home in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin and left a note for her parents, telling them that she was going to be sent back to prison and needed to sort out a few things beforehand. The note also stated that she and her boyfriend were on their way to California so she could see the ocean. As far as we know, Shanna hopped into the car with her boyfriend and they began their trip from Wisconsin to California. Google Maps shows the two most common routes to California. The first route, and the route that Shanna and her boyfriend are assumed to have taken, drives through Minneapolis, Minnesota, South Dakota, Wyoming, Utah, Nevada, and then into California. The second most likely route goes through Southern Minnesota, Iowa, Nebraska, Colorado, Utah, Nevada, and then into California. This route will become important later on. According to Shanna's family, her childhood had been normal and the trouble didn't start until she transitioned into her teenage years when she began taking drugs and exhibiting signs of behavioral problems and that's when things started to go downhill. That was until 2014 when she found out she was pregnant. 
This shock announcement spurred her on, and she got on a path of sobriety and eventually got clean. Sadly, this sobriety only lasted for a little while, and shortly after, she began using drugs again and was sent to prison on drug charges. Shanna was released on probation and ordered to serve house arrest following the birth of her daughter, which she completed without incident, according to her father. Naturally, after being under house arrest, Shanna was put on parole and assigned to parole officer. According to the Charlie Project, Shanna had been caught drinking in June 2016 and had an outstanding warrant against her for parole violations. Shanna knew that the parole violation meant that she would likely be back behind bars, leading her to leave the note for her parents and take care of business before she found herself back in an orange jumpsuit. The details in Shanna's case became somewhat confusing from here on out. According to some reports, Shanna was last seen near Interstate 94 and County Road 74 in St. Cloud, Minnesota on June 22, 2016. Now, as per Google Maps, the two routes to California drive through are close to Minneapolis and then down either into South Dakota or Wyoming. What is really odd about this, though, is that St. Cloud, Minnesota is 65 miles north of Minneapolis and is completely off route. There may be another route to California that would take you through or near this area, but no one knows why they might have taken this route. This is just a minor point found while researching that we wanted to bring up. Witnesses reported seeing Shanna and her boyfriend arguing in the car around 3 p.m. And in the heat of the argument, Shanna got out of the car and stormed off into the woods around the highway. It is unclear what Shanna and her boyfriend were arguing about, but her family did tell investigators that she was known to hitchhike. It is possible that she jumped into someone else's car to try and get to California. Another bizarre fact in Shanna's case is the fact that she apparently left home without her bag and didn't own a cell phone at the time. It's unclear on how the couple were planning on funding that trip to California and whether Shanna's boyfriend was going to pick up the tab. Shanna has no connections to St. Cloud, Minnesota, and her family are now asking for the public's help. Shanna Boito was last seen in St. Cloud, Minnesota on June 22, 2016, as we mentioned, near Interstate 94 and County Road 74. She's described as a white female with brown hair and brown eyes and has a tattoo of two sparrows on her hips and a tattoo of the name Millie with no E behind her right ear. Shanna also has a lip and belly button piercing and has stretched earlobes. Her Charlie Project profile reads, Boito has a history of drug abuse. Caution is advised when approaching her. She was last seen wearing a tan Victoria's Secret tank top with the word pink on it, black leggings and no shoes. Foul play is not suspected at this time in her case, and if you have any information regarding her whereabouts, you're asked to please contact the Chippewa Falls Police Department at 715-723-4424. Well, friends, there you have it. What do you make of these five strange and creepy disappearances? Somewhere, somebody knows something. People don't just vanish in thin air. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to reading your comments. But please, keep it friendly and respectful. In the meantime, be good to yourselves and each other, and I'll see you just a little farther on down the trail. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'll talk to you next time.